Life as a 19th Century Sailor, a 45-minute presentation recorded at the Defence Academy, Shrivenham, on the 1st of October 2009. The presenter is Dr Virginia Preston. So I've been looking at sailors, sailors in the Royal Navy really in the period after the end of the Napoleonic Wars up to about the middle of the century. And I've been trying very much to look at the ordinary sailors rather than the officers because the officers tend to get a lot more attention from historians, partly because they are often easier... There are more records, so it's easier to write about them. Nearly the end of writing my thesis, a friend of mine looked at the abstract and said, oh, it's all about human resources. She is, works in human resources. And I said, no, no, it's not at all. But of course, on reflection, it is. It's, I've looked at who the sailors were, where they came from, some of the reasons they might have joined the Navy and the kind of experiences they had in the Navy and their sort of training and promotion and so on. And indeed, how successful the Navy was at keeping them on. And I've looked at things like recruitment, retention, work conditions, and they were all very central to my work. There's a stereotype of what a sailor, a 19th century sailor in the age of sail was like, and of what kind of conditions that they worked in, that they were appalling, they were whipped, roof captains were brutal, they were forced to go to sea, they were at sea from an extremely young age, and of course they were mostly drunk. So I'll be looking at how true some of those things were. This is exactly what you might think of when you think of the age of sail. This is Princess Charlotte. She was a first-rate ship. She served in the Mediterranean in the period that I've been looking at as the flagship. And she's exactly what you associate with the Navy of this period. It's still a very much a Navy that Nelson would have recognised. Steamships, though, were just starting to become part of the Navy in this period. The screw propeller wasn't invented until the 1840s, but they did use paddle steamers for inshore work on the anti-slavery patrols. And then just in the later part of the period, they start to build proper big ships that are powered by steam. Because, of course, once you've got the screw propeller, you can actually arm the ships properly paddle steamer is extremely difficult to fit guns to. One of the things I suppose we should just do is a brief bit of context for the Navy in this period. So after 1815, it's still, you know, obviously a crucial to British foreign trade and defence policy. It's still stationed all over the world, protecting trade, fighting the slave trade, enforcing policy. Paul Kennedy describes it as one side of the triangular frame supporting the Pax Britannica, the other two sides being the empire, formal and informal, and the Industrial Revolution. The French Navy was Britain's closest rival, but of course the French Navy had just been defeated and they were very unwilling to challenge British maritime superiority at this time. The United States Navy was only just starting to grow, so Britain did at that point temporarily rule the waves. And there are various crises, although it's a time of peace, there are various crises that involve the Navy. In 1827, there's a battle of Navarino against the Turkish and Egyptians uh, with France and Russia. And in 1840, for example, there's a bombardment of Acre in which the Princess Charlotte took part. Then again, you've got the early fighting in China and the taking of Hong Kong. In 1859, there was a big royal commission on who went into the Navy, how best to man the Navy and how to recruit enough sailors. And I was very taken with this quote from James Carden, who clearly felt that uh, at one time anyway, to go to the Navy was everything for a poor boy, but that things had gone a bit downhill since he was a boy. It's not, of course, in 1815. The Royal Navy had 214 ships of the line, about 100 of which were in commission. Immediately after the end of the war, of course, it's massively reduced in size. By 1821, there's only 13 70-gun ships, 70 or more gun ships, in active service, and it's got 19,000 sailors instead of the 145,000 that it had needed in 1815. The numbers do start to go up again a bit, you can see here. In the later part of the period, in the 1840s, there's a bit more mobilisation and there's a possibility of a clash with France. But basically, it remains, from after 1815, a much smaller entity than it had been during all the Napoleonic Wars period. And one thing, of course, that I should emphasise here is that we don't have any press gang after the end of 1815. A lot of the time when I tell people what I do, they say, oh, yes, the press gang. I'm like, no, actually, all these men are volunteers. The press gang stops, of course, with the end of the war. The legal powers to press do stay on the books and they're explicitly laid out in various acts and so on that go before Parliament. And they do assume that if there's a national emergency, they will need to enforce service again for the kind of mobilisation they imagine would be needed. But it's just never actually put into practice. And there are, of course, lots and lots of campaigns against the press gang and against what are considered the more brutal aspects of the older Navy inside and outside Parliament. The powers, of course, is an argument entry that the powers stay, and of course they're the basis in some ways for conscription in the two world wars in the 20th century, but they're never actually used for the Navy again. Another important point to remember about these men is that they don't join the Navy in this period, they join a ship. 
They go to Portsmouth or Plymouth or wherever, and they go to a particular ship and they sign on with that ship for the length of that ship's commission. And at the end of it, they're discharged. Could easily be three years away. Now, there are men, and I will, one of the things that I've been arguing is that, in fact, there are men who regard the Royal Navy as their profession and who do repeatedly come back, but they don't have to. And it's not until 1853 that they introduced the system of continuous service, where you actually, as a sailor, an ordinary sailor, join the Navy rather than the ship. And then you sign up for 10 years and you can repeat for another 10 years. But they do, they keep absolutely very, very good records of who's serving when and on which ships and what ratings they were and how much they were paid. And you can, if you accumulate 20 years service, you can have a pension. And they have, I mean, this is basically where I found all the information that I needed, or some of the information I needed. They keep the wonderful muster books, beautifully handwritten, with the details of the sailor and where they were born, and how old they were when they joined, and what previous service they have, how much they spent on tobacco and how much on soap. It seems very mean that they had to buy their own soap, but they did. And whether there's a change in their rating over the period, and whether they have an allotment to go home. And when someone applies for a pension, they go back through the muster books, and they check that the service that they say that they had all happened. And then if it all checks off, then they get their pension. They also will go back through the muster books for somebody who's been a persistent deserter, and they will mark in those that they were a persistent deserter, because then they won't necessarily get their pension at the end of it. And the sailors were ambivalent about the new system when it comes to taking on continuous service and joining the Navy. Now, in some ways, obviously, you'd think it'd be better because it gives you 10 years' worth of employment rather than three. But there are plenty who actually really preferred the sort of flexibility that they had when they could choose their ship. And, of course, it did mean that you could choose your officers as well as your ship. Uh, John Donnelly was a seaman rigger who'd served in four Royal Navy ships and in the Merchant Service and gave evidence to the Royal Commission in 1859 about why he hadn't become a continuous serviceman because it was a bit optional, obviously, for a while, as the new system bedded in. Even though there was extra pay, not everyone took it. But he deeply resented that men who were not as experienced as him were getting much more money... But he said, you know, perhaps I've got into a ship where the discipline is very strict and the consequence is I may think I've only about 18 months or two years to run and the ship will pay off and I can go and be my own master. But if I'm a continuous serviceman, I might get into trouble. He said, the only advantage I ever knew of non-continuous service was liberty, but that was enough to make it far preferable to him. When I'm paid off from my ship, let me have my liberty and I can go and suit myself. The commissioners tried very hard, actually, when he was giving evidence to persuade him to be better off as a continuous serviceman because he could always use his extra pay to buy himself out, but he was absolutely unconvinced. I mean, clearly, in terms of competition for men in this period, for trained sailors, it's the merchant service, which at the time, of course, is extremely important. It's a huge part of the uh, British Empire and trade. So one of the things that the Commission looked at was why would men go for one rather than the other, and why might they prefer one service over the other? James Carden said that he thought that one of the attractions of the Royal Navy over the merchant service was the appearance of the sailors. There wasn't an official uniform, but they were given material to make their own clothes, and they did make their own clothes. And he said, Our seamen are losing ground. They are losing their popular name in the country that they once had. And I think that's greatly owing to the appearance of the men on shore. The sailors at one time appeared on shore, especially on Sunday, decently dressed with a good suit of blue clothes, and no one was ashamed to countenance a sailor. In fact, when I was young, it made all the boys eager to enter the Navy. To go for a sailor was everything for a poor boy, but now you frequently see a seaman with his three yards of surge ashore, and society, I think, look round at him and despise him. One of the things they recommended, in fact, the Commission, was that there should be a proper uniform issued, and that it shouldn't actually cost, you shouldn't be charged for the clothes that you wore. Another sailor giving evidence to the Commission compared um, working in the merchant service to working in the Navy, and said, it's pleasanter in some respects, but not in others. In the Navy, you are clean and comfortable. In the merchant service, you are dirty. And there are many things of that kind. You cannot have your grub properly, but you can have more of it. You can go and cut off a joint of meat. I've been in one ship of war where on Saturday afternoon, Saturday at dinner time, we shared out the bread dust. And until Monday afternoon, when the bread was served out again, we did not have a mouthful. Another thing that sailors said they thought put people off the Royal Navy was drill. There was too much of what they call nonsense, said William Smith, who was a bosun. There's too much drill. One thing, though, that there really isn't any evidence for, it's been argued by some historians that the legacy of the press gang was that there was kind of fear and loathing amongst sailors generally of the Royal Navy and that they didn't want to go into the Royal Navy. I really haven't found any evidence of that at all. And there are a lot of men who transfer back and forth, as well as a significant proportion who stick with the Royal Navy throughout. Over 70% of the men that I looked at who had no previous service in the Royal Navy but were rated as able seamen or ordinary seamen, which meant they had some experience at sea and were therefore obviously coming in from the merchant service. One of the things I did, I took a sample of 23 ships and made a big database of the information out of the muster books for those 23 ships. 
And I tried to choose them to cover as many different aspects of the Royal Navy in the 1830s and 40s as I could. So there are large ships like the Princess Charlotte, which had a complement of 460 men, 90 boys and 165 marines. And she was the flagship in the Mediterranean for Vice Admiral Sir Robert Sopford. Then there were very, very small ships like HMS Mastiff, which was a surveying vessel, mostly in the Orkney Islands, which had 39 men, 7 boys and no marines at all. And they saw service all over the world, these ships. And, of course, one of the key things that they were doing in this period were the patrols against the slave trade, which had been abolished in 1807. But, of course, the anti-slavery patrols don't really get going until after 1815. There are some, but it was a little bit stretched at the time. But in this period, it's a very important part of the work, but they tend to use smaller ships for that because they're better for inshore work. And I've got 4,637 men in my sample. And I have found that there are a significant chunk of them who basically do seem to treat the Navy as their major employer and their major career. Though you do get, obviously, a proportion who sign on and then change their minds about six weeks later and desert because they can't bear it any longer. And almost all of them, except the very newest boys, had experience at sea, even if it wasn't in a man of war. This is attempting to look at where the English sailors came from. And obviously the classic image probably is of a West Country man, and there are clearly lots of those. And as you'd expect, main bases in this period are Portsmouth, Plymouth and Sheerness and Chatham. So you can see Hampshire, Devon, London and Kent and Cornwall are top of the list. It's not entirely consistent, that pattern. You know, you'll find sometimes there's a ship recruiting in Plymouth, but one I found in particular, HM Steamship Comet, but nonetheless 42% of its men have been born in London. But there is obviously a significant bias there. And in fact, there is somebody from every county in England, including one man from Rutland. And there are significant numbers from Lancashire and Yorkshire, but clearly is a very strong southern bias. And of course, we have to remember that there's a very good reason why it's useful for the Royal Navy to be in the south in this period. This is not why they were there, but the south in this period is the poorer part of England. As if you think about it, you know, the Industrial Revolution is really much more concentrated in the north. Food prices fall after the end of the war because the harvests are better and, of course, wartime demand is now over. Agriculture was depressed and, of course, you've got men who've come back from the war. I mean, think of all those men who are no longer required by the Navy and have to be reintegrated into other trades and, indeed, and indeed the army. And at the same time, there's a certain amount of machinery being developed and replacing some kinds of labour. An agricultural labourer in Dorset which has to be admitted was one of the poorest counties in England in the period, was getting seven shillings and ten pence a week. In Norfolk they got a bit more, ten shillings and seven pence. But in Lancashire they got twelve shillings and five pence a week. And cotton spinning trade wages were something like 23 shillings, and the coal miners could earn 20 shillings. So the Royal Navy's wages in this period, although they're not fantastic, they're getting one pound 14 shillings a month, a lunar month, for an able seaman, which is eight shillings and five pence a week. And that includes, of course, their keep. And in fact, a sort of enforced savings scheme. Uh, that's not quite how they saw it, but uh, it did mean that at the end of the voyage you would get a significant chunk of money. It's actually a reasonably attractive option in the South. I don't think they would have done so well had they been needing to recruit in Liverpool, say. In the Napoleonic Wars, of course, you know that the Royal Navy is just recruiting from wherever it can get somebody. You know, if you can sail, if you can be useful on a ship, they want you. I still find in this period, even though it's retrenched, there's a quarter of all sailors are not born in England, and this is where they come from instead. Obviously, there's a large Irish contingent and Scottish, and there are African sailors, Welsh, North American, West Indies, Malta, Germany. But there's a tiny, tiny number who were born at sea, which is interesting. Of course, sometimes I think they're talking about being born on a troop ship or something that was fairly local, but nonetheless, there are some. There are men from Sweden, Holland, Spain, Corfu, four from France... And there's a lot of variety between ships, as you'd expect. Ships in home waters have a much larger percentage of, of English-born sailors. So African-born men are only 2% of the whole sample, and they're concentrated mainly in a few ships off the West African coast on the anti-slavery patrols. And these particular men were mostly crewmen, which is K-R-O-O-M-E-N. And they were recruited, according to the official line, because they needed to perform duties which cannot be performed by Europeans without an enormous sacrifice of health and life. Those particular men were very much treated as a slightly separate part of the crew. They weren't fully recruited into the ship's company. They had a separate pay scheme, and they were discharged locally before they went back. But they, did, they were given certificates, and they sometimes did recur in later ships. But there are other African-born and black sailors who were recruited normally into the ship's company and who are, as far as I can tell, treated as other members of the ship's company. There's certainly no pay discrimination. Some of them occasionally get promoted. I mean, the numbers are so small that it's hard to say very much about that. Must books have a huge load of information. The real joy is when you can also find a description book for a ship.
because the description book actually has a physical description of every member of the crew. It tells you things like whether they were married. It tells you what trade they were brought up to. And it's got various other information about them. They don't, unfortunately, survive in lots of cases. So where they have survived, I've added that information in, and it's been really interesting. But in lots of cases, I have located in a few ships, for example, a black sailor because of the description, but you wouldn't know otherwise because he was born in Bristol. Something which is also, of course, part of the traditional stereotype and which absolutely does hold pretty true is that sailors are young men. They're not, in this period, quite as young as you might imagine that sailors, some sailors were in the Napoleonic period. The boys, they recruit at the age of 14 to 20. So you're a second-class boy from 14 to 16 and then a first-class boy from 16 to 20. And you don't go into the ship's company until you're 20. And then the largest groups of men in the ship's company are aged 20, 21, 22 at the time that they join the ship. And that pattern has changed significantly over the previous century. So in the Seven Years' War, most men had been at sea from the age of about 10. The youngest boy I found is a 10-year-old who was born in Kingston, Jamaica, and recruited onto HMS Skipjack, who was commissioning out there in 1829, and he had previous service recorded. Whether that's true or not, we don't know, but that was what was written down. Apart from him, I found about five 12-year-olds and six 13-year-olds listed. So clearly the rules are stretched occasionally, and of course we don't know. Some of the 14-year-olds may have been a bit younger, but the assumption was that they should be at least 14, so if you looked 10, they probably wouldn't be taking you. And they do at this point start to issue regulations about how tall you've got to be or how old you've got to look, even if they can't know. I mean, we should remember that, you know, 19th century Britain has quite a young population, so sailors inevitably are going to reflect that. 45% of the population in 1841 were aged under 20. And there are plenty of men in their later 20s and 30s on board ship, a few in their 50s, and two men, one quartermaster and one able seaman, who give their age of 60. They're the oldest that I have found. Most of the men in their 50s are acting as cooks and stewards, but there are still a few rated able seamen, and therefore presumably partly working actively as sailors. It is primarily a young man's trade, but there are some who go on learning their living at it until they're old. Because a lot of them are so young, most of them are not married. But again, when you start to investigate this a bit more deeply, the pattern is a bit more varied. And one of the ways that we can look at this is that the Navy had set up, in 1758, set up a system to allow sailors to send money home. And it was revised a few times. And this was the allotment system. In 1759, only about 3% of men were taking advantage of this. And some ships, nobody did. But by the time I'm looking at, there are quite a lot of men who are taking advantage of this. And it was a free system. You just had to sign a will and power saying, giving the name of the person who was to receive the money. Then what would happen is that the person who was getting the allotment had to go to the dockyard to collect their money and receive the agreed payment there. And it might be something like 15 shillings a month. This is not a period where there's much of a concept of a family wage. That's really a later 19th century development. So it's, it is absolutely always assumed that different partners in a family will be bringing money in. There's no assumption that a sailor should be able to support a family while he's away without them having any other income, but that some income should be contributed. I should point out, of course, that because you had to go to the dockyard to claim your allotment, it's not much use if your family don't actually live near a dockyard. So it's only really helpful to those whose families are in, say, Portsmouth or Plymouth or London. This is information taken from some of the description books which do discuss marriage rates, which do give you information on marriage rates. And you can see it varies really quite a lot from ship to ship. On Caledonia, over half the crew are married. On Acorn, about 20%. Espoir, over 50%. Then down to 12% on Virago, 14% on Winchester. And as you might expect, a lot of that's got to do with where those ships are serving. Caledonia is in Devonport and Dublin. Espoir, I think, is in Portsmouth. Winchester goes to Australia. So it's an issue about what kind of service you can take. And of course, again, this is something that perhaps relates to being able to choose your ship and is a benefit that some of the sailors feel, that as they get a bit older and perhaps they have got married and started a family, they can choose a ship that's in home water so they'll be able to get home a little bit more frequently to see them. And you might not feel quite so prepared to sign up three years going to Australia and back if you had children and wife at home. This isn't the only way, of course, that we can look at what kind of ties sailors had and what kind of links back to their families at home. There are some, not very many, but there are some letters. They'd instituted a penny post for sailors and indeed soldiers since the end of the 18th century. So as long as your commanding officer signed your letter, it, it could go anywhere for a penny. But of course, the letters only get to travel by ship, so communication is pretty difficult and pretty uncertain. And you do get some very sad letters. So this is Emma Mackenzie, who was married to Robert, who was a boatswain in HMS Alligator serving in Sydney. Dear husband, I have sent you six letters since last August, 
I have wrote to you every opportunity I heard of, and I have received no answers. I think I am quite forgot, as though I had never been in the world. I have received but three letters from you since you left Plymouth. She had been unwell, and one of the children had been unwell, and she was plainly feeling exceptionally cut off from support. I mean, in fact, three letters in seven months from a ship in Australia is not a terrible rate of correspondence for the period. It took Alligator five months to get to Sydney. But clearly they did actually correspond quite a lot, these two. I mean, there's only, I found three letters from her and three letters from him, but there's references within those to other letters, and they clearly wrote regularly. And he notes things like, you know, he's taking advantage of an officer who's being invalided home, so he's sending some letters back with him so they can be posted when they get back. Another sailor whose fact papers that I found called John Ford he served on HMS Superb as an able seaman. He later on became a bosun. He wrote home regularly and he would include messages for friends and family. So he'd say, my friend so-and-so, please could you tell his mother that he's well. Clearly, we don't know. We just don't know what the literacy rates were. Clearly, they weren't that high. But there was quite an established network of attempting to communicate with friends and family at home. The letters we have from him are all back home to his sweetheart, Sarah and he conducts pretty much the entire courtship by letter, and he writes her at one point in 1846, suggesting that it was fine weather to make the bands grow, and then clearly doesn't get a reply. It's not clear whether she actually got that letter or not. And then there's a rather desperate one later saying, there was a very particular question in my last time, which I should like to have an answer, as I've been longing to hear. The next time you write, I hope you'll be able to send a whole sheet of paper instead of a quarter of one. I should say, it did get married. <laughs> uh, we know that. We, in fact, don't have any letters from after they were married, but we've got letters to the children. And we've got various other papers relating to the family and, and his allotment home and things like that. So the marriage rate and the allotment rates that we've got do give us, you know, I think they, they massively complicate the picture of this young footloose sailor. But of course, that's not to say there aren't any. What is interesting as well is, of course, you probe more deeply and you get a much more complicated picture. I'm going to move on a bit now to more about what it's actually like being on board ship. And this is about the fact that, of course, there is really quite a high risk of disease, injury or death. I mean, in the 19th century, you know, life expectancy is much lower than it is now anyway. But the sailors' life expectancy was definitely lower than men of a similar age in the general population. So roughly, for the men I've been looking at, the death rate is something like 12.6 per thousand per year and the general population in their age group is about nine per thousand per year. And this shows you some of the things that, that happen to them. It's not a huge sample, it's kind of indicative, because they don't always record in the muster book what the cause of death was. They will record that someone's discharged dead, but not always exactly what happened. But we have a large number who died in hospital, some who were explicitly noted as dying of fever, some who were drowned, a few who were killed in action, some who fell from a loft, and some who were just by accident. Diseases, obviously, in this period on board ship could range from things like smallpox and cholera, which were known and devastating on land as well around the world, to yellow fever, which is obviously quite a specific risk of serving on the West African station. For example, on board HMS Acorn on the Cape Station, 1839-41, there were 661 cases of sickness amongst the 156 men who served on her during three years. Six men died and 27 were invalided. There weren't actually any deaths from fever, although there were 24 cases of fever. But four men died of diarrhoea, one of inflammation of the liver, and one from another knee disease that they don't say. Then she went to the west coast of Africa station, 1842, for two years, and five men caught what they called intermittent fever, which is almost certainly malaria. And of the 20 who came down with continued and remittent fever, another variant of malaria really, two died. Uh, one man died of erysipelas, and two drowned. The most frequent health problems that weren't the result of a wound or an accident on the ship were diarrhoea, ulcers, dyspepsia and rheumatism. And of course, many of the health problems that sailors faced were those that were faced by the population where they were serving. Things like cholera are just as much of a risk in this period in crowded cities at home as they are on board ship and they spread just as fast. The cholera, of course, only reaches the UK in 1832 and is initially quite devastating. And there's a horrible outbreak in Portsmouth in the late 1830s, which killed a lot of people. And of course, one thing about serving in the Royal Navy in this period is that you actually get free health care which is not something that you get anywhere else if you're an ordinary working person. I mean, this is not obviously out of the benevolence of the Admiralty's heart. They want the sailors to be fit and well to work, and they supply surgeons and assistant surgeons on most ships. A lot of these surgeons were extremely dedicated, and they spent a lot of time keeping records, trying to work out better treatments, and where they were extremely interested in understanding what the health problems were and how they were treated. And you get also, say, on the new steamships, of course, you get surgeons who are very worried about what's going to be the effect of working in extremely high temperatures for the stokers in particular. 
but generally what's that going to do to men's health and they keep lengthy records and observations of what they see. Their care and their surgical skills no doubt saved the lives of a lot of men, but unfortunately, of course, a lot of the diseases they treated weren't very well understood, and some of the treatments were pointless or harmful. In 1823, Captain Owen of the Leven reported that 60 men had died of fever on board that ship while she was surveying the east coast of Africa, and that, in his opinion, the bleeding that the surgeons insisted in inflicting on the patients was a contributory factor in the death. One of the deaths was actually one of the surgeons. I mean, they, they bled themselves as well as everybody else, and he's probably right probably was a country factor. And bleeding carries on, really, throughout this period up into the 1860s as a normal treatment for fever. Although, at the same time, they are getting to grips with quinine again, which had long been known about, but they'd kind of lost as a treatment, and they start to get to grips with that again, and in the 1840s, trying to work out what the dosage should be. And eventually, they do get to grips with that, that you need to start taking it before you go to the malarial area, rather than after you've got the fever, which is what they started with. Unfortunately, another popular treatment was calomel, which is uh, mercury chloride which is given to cholera patients as a purgative. A, it's poisonous, and B, cholera, of course, one of the major risks is dehydration. That's what a lot of people die from. I don't think that that particularly helped when they were treating cholera. Drowning and falling from a loft caused 45% of the deaths in the Royal Navy where I've got the cause given. The disease and drowning or falling from a loft are pretty similar in the numbers, although we should probably consider that pretty much everyone who dies in hospital probably was from disease. And generally, you should remember, of course, that even in the Napoleonic Wars, when they're actually fighting considerable amounts, death from disease is much greater than death in action. Falling from the rigging was, I suppose, an inevitable hazard of large sailing ships. And I've got a short account here of one such episode. It was on a Friday that I was overhauling my chest when I was startled by the cry of a man overboard. The ship was brought to and the cutter manned and lowered, but it was too late. The Monday after, I dined with the captain and after dinner, we as usual had reef topsails and a man was coming down the mizzen topmast rigging. He slipped and fell. He struck against the mizzen chains. He was killed, for they saw him floating for a second or two. He did not move and then went down. The boat was lowered and everything done that could be. I was surprised how little the captain seemed to be affected. That account was from Samuel Gurney Cresswell, who was then on his first voyage as a volunteer apprentice, at this point what they're calling someone who's going to go on to be a commissioned officer, in HMS Agincourt in 1842. Not everyone, of course, was so unlucky. And in fact, if you did fall and didn't hit the deck, which could be really quite dangerous, if you fell in the sea, you might stand a better chance. So the very next day, just as we were setting down to dinner, we saw a man swimming. He was a beautiful swimmer. He had fell from the fore rigging and was picked up. The Royal Humane Society gave out medals for life-saving. And there's a long, long list of men who were saved by other sailors and by officers jumping in who could swim, jumping in and saving them. But you did need, obviously, the sea not to be too rough and it would be impossible to launch a boat to pick you up. But a lot of men were actually saved. But then there were other issues when if the weather was bad, you could, might get into an accident. So there's another case. We had some gales of wind round in the end of Java Head. One night she rolled tremendously. Three or four chests went adrift. A man got his arm broke, so they were obliged to take it off. He was made a good recovery and was sent home, but obviously that was probably it for his career in the Royal Navy. Another whose career ended with an accident was John Hayes, captain of the Foxal and HMS Albion in January 1827 who was 39. He received a blow on the right arm when working on the foretop, by which the humerus was fractured, the elbow damaged, and his wrist fractured and dislocated. His injuries healed. He was left with permanently damaged joints and a deformed wrist and had to be invalided. I will just briefly point out, there were, of course, even in this period, there were a few deaths in action. I found eight men in my sample who died in action, and seven of them were in New Zealand, serving on HMS Castor in 1846, fighting the local population. The eighth man was Edward Gordon, who was killed in the bombardment of Acre on HMS Princess Charlotte. Of course, one of the things that we absolutely think of when we think of ships in this period probably is scurvy in terms of health. In fact, they're pretty good with scurvy in this period. It's weird. It almost gets more dangerous again later in the 19th century because they don't understand... They understand that... Not they don't understand vitamin C because vitamin C has not been discovered yet. But they understand that fresh food and that lemons, say, are very, very good. They think limes must be even better because they're even sharper. But in fact, limes don't contain as much vitamin C as lemons. So as you shift to reliance on limes, you actually, on long voyages, and particularly on some of the exploration voyages in the later century, later half of the 19th century, you end up with more scurvy, because actually relying on lime, and hence limeys, is actually less good than relying on lemons. But in fact, mostly in this period, they're taking on enough fresh food. And of course, the other thing that's happening is as you start to have steamships, you need to coal more often, and therefore you have to go into port, and therefore you pick up fresh food at the same time as you pick up fuel. It's a sailing ship, of course, could be victualled and watered, and you could be at sea for six months. As long as you had enough water, you didn't absolutely have to go back to shore. 
but you would potentially get some cases of scurvy. I mean, it's really then, after you introduce um, steamships, it's really not until you get something like a nuclear-powered vessel that you can actually stay away from port for so long again. One thing, of course, that I should perhaps talk about is alcohol. It's certainly something that was affected his health and affected the sailor's discipline, and it was certainly recognised as such by everybody at the time, but it wasn't always very clear what they were going to do about it. Sailors got a ration of half a pint of rum a day until 1824, when it was halved to a quarter of a pint, but then this was on the old measures, and then the change to imperial measures in 1825 increased this again, because a quarter of a pint was more, was a fifth more than it had been. In 1850, I mean, there had long been a lot of campaigns about the abomination of alcohol, but Parliament set up a committee, rather splendidly called the Committee Appointed to Inquire into the Expediency of Diminishing the Present Quantity of Spirits Served Out Daily to the Seamen in the Royal Navy. On the recommendation of this committee, they halved the ration again, and they made it possible to have tea and sugar instead of some of the drink. There are, of course, lots of accounts of drunken sailors in the archives. And Midshipman Comber, who has recorded, for example, that they were at anchor in Sydney. Some of our officers went on shore, amongst them the captain. He gave permission to the ship's company to go on shore. They returned in the evening, all raving drunk, as might have been expected. And then in December that year, the ship was back in Sydney, and Captain Nice has stopped the leave of the ship's company because they got drunk. And occasioned a paragraph being published in the Sydney Gazette titled a comparison between the American and British seamen puffing up the Yankees as a quiet, sober and orderly set and condemning us as drunken reprobates. It's a wonder if our men don't pull their house about their ears. And in fact, the real problem with alcohol on board ship is that it's currency. It's not so much that they can't cope with having a quarter of a pint of rum a day split into two servings. It's that they use it to sell things to each other. So they'd sell it if they preferred tea, or they'd give it to somebody who was good at making clothes, so they'd make the clothes for them, or they'd give it to the cook of the mess because the mess always got a bit extra. And sometimes they'd give it to somebody for their birthday. You get the odd case where someone gets the whole mess as ration for their birthday, and uh, they're dead. Some of the sailors who gave evidence to the committee denied that they'd ever come across this practice, but it's very, very clear there was absolutely currency aboard ship. But it was very difficult because the other thing is that they used it as a punishment. So if you want to punish someone, you stop their grog. But then that makes it very clear that it's a right of everybody. If they have been behaving well, they should get their drink. When you look at the promotions and demotions of the petty officer rates, a lot of it is associated, you know, someone got drunk and then they had to be disrated back to able seamen. It's certainly a recurring theme at the courts martial, which is mostly, if you get to court martial, you're probably petty officer rank. So a carpenter in HMS Birkenhead was brought to court martial in January 1848 for drunkenness, disobedience of orders and mutinous language, and he was dismissed the service. A boatswain in HMS Stiller was court martialed in 1838 for drunkenness, absenting himself from his station and otherwise neglecting his duty but he was only reprimanded. Of the 523 charges brought to court-martial and recorded in the Admiralty Indexes, 151 explicitly involved drunkenness, and I think we can probably assume that those are not the only cases where it was a factor. I should point out, though, officers, of course, also drank and caused disciplinary problems. It's by no means limited to the men. Um, Surgeon Edward Cree noted in his journal on Rattlesnake in 1840, or roughly 1840, that their second master had been tried by court-martial for putting his captain under arrest. It was supposed that both of them were drunk. And he described another officer as a jolly fellow, I fancy given to rum and water. And Commander Tatham, who gave evidence to the committee about reducing the amount of spirits, said, I have no hesitation in stating that in framing rules for the prevention of drunkenness amongst the men, it requires an equal provision to prevent drunkenness amongst the officers. And I think in edging any legislation upon a point of this kind, a uniform coat should be no protection at all. It was, of course. Many of them believed it shouldn't. I'm not going to talk very much about flogging, but I admit that it is one of the things that we think of when we think of the 19th century Navy. Drink was not the only entertainment. They did things, this is a carved whalebone seam rubber, which is for pressing the seams of sails when you're sewing them. They sewed their own clothes, of course. They may well have paid somebody else to, to do some of that, but they had to make their own clothes. They were issued with material when they joined the ship rather than any actual made-up clothes. And they did things like embroidery, there's quite a few embroidered pictures in the National Maritime Museum collection that you can see. Some of them actually, on, there are pictures of some of them on, the, on their website as well, if you have a look. But usually an embroidered picture of your own ship passing Gibraltar, or some of them are done in wool and some in silks, and they did carvings. And there are all sorts of, course, traditions like the crossing the line ceremony, which is very much embedded by this point, and which is, there are quite a few descriptions in various memoirs. It's a pretty vicious, actually, is mostly the impression I get. So it tends to be written about by men who hadn't encountered it before, of course, and so were the victims of the ducking and the forced shaving with tar, and they didn't enjoy it very much at all. But, of course, it was an excuse for a certain amount of drinking 
as was Christmas, which was often an extra ration would be served out. I would just like to look briefly at the sort of career structure that a sailor could have. Before 1815, of course, really their choices are quite limited because although technically you sign up for a ship as afterwards, even whether you're pressed or not and are discharged at the end, the likelihood is very much that you will get discharged straight into another Royal Navy ship and quite possibly sent away again for another three years. You certainly didn't get much by way of leave because the fear was always that if you gave leave, the men would run. In fact, of course, it tends to be the other way around. That if you give enough leave, they're less likely to run. But that's something which only a very few captains recognised. Also, the issue is simply that there aren't really enough sailors for both the Merchant Service and the Royal Navy in the war. So one of the ways that you have enough bodies is just by restricting the amount of time that anyone can spend on shore. With peace, the sailors are able to research some control over their lives. I mean, they're constrained, obviously, by what ships are recruiting and by what alternatives are open to them in the Merchant Service. But they do actually have some choices. They can choose whether or not to go into the Royal Navy at all. And when they did choose the Navy, they could decide on a ship where they thought the officers were good, perhaps, or that they had shipmates, or whether they could obtain a petty officer's position. And at the end of commission, they could take as much time as they wanted before they decided whether to volunteer again. From the Admiralty's point of view, of course, this is a really inefficient system. And for the men, it does mean that they don't have any guarantee of employment. But it does offer this significant freedom, and a lot of them do value that very much. And it doesn't prevent them regarding themselves as Royal Navy men and returning again and again to the Navy. There's also a tendency amongst some historians to write about as though the 19th century was... In 1815, we have these rough, untrained, unprofessional sailors who are forced into service. And then by the end of the century, we form the Navy, it's much smaller, we've got continuous service, and by then we have a professional rating. And it's a very different system. It is a very different system by the end of the century. But the professional standards of the men in this period are very, very high. And indeed, the professional standards of most of the ones who are serving on board in the Napoleonic Wars are very, very high. They sail and fight those ships extremely well. I mean, a lot of it's, it's sheer experience, but there are very high standards. And in fact, they are monitored. There are less clear career structures, and some of the things are just starting to get introduced in this period, but there are structures there. They are monitored. And of course, one of the great things with peacetime, as far as the officers are concerned, is that they can now get rid of men who are useless. And you do get men who are discharged as useless or turned away and not recruited in the first place. So you are actually don't really see that many landsmen come on board. And most captains and lieutenants are making an effort to offer training to the men and boys who are serving in the ships and to assess them for promotion. Boys, as I said, were taken on between 14 and 19, and ships could take as many as their complements allowed. And they served at least seven years, so they did actually sign up for a chunk of time. They didn't all stay on as adults, but a lot of them did. They introduced in this period something called the Seaman's Schoolmaster, which is a post to actually start teaching the sailors to read and write, which, of course, literacy is essential if you want to have warrant rank and you're much more likely to get petty officer rank if you're illiterate. And one of the things they do is, of course, set up HMS Excellent in 1832 to train seamen gunners, then sign up for five years, and they were given financial incentives to stay on for longer. So if they stayed in the Navy for up to 15 years, they got seven shillings extra a month. And, of course, some of them then went on to become warrant officers as gunners. Could they complicate the pay structure continually? I couldn't get this onto a slide because it just wouldn't go. There are a lot of different rates, and they do add more. The other thing they do in this period is they start to add extra pay for rates which had included some extra responsibility, like Captain of the Foretop, but they hadn't actually had any extra money before. And now they do actually start to add that. And, of course, the other thing that happens is that they start to have steamships and they need stokers, and they recognise that stoking is really, really, really unpleasant, and they get more pay than an able seaman. Although most of them are able seamen because, of course, steamships, they try to use the steam as little as possible. They're still in this period, they're all, they all have sails as well. And they sail as much as possible to conserve the coal because, of course, the engines are still relatively inefficient and the more they use, the more frequently they have to go into port. These are end-of-service certificates. Petty officer rates, of course, are all, at this point, at the captain's discretion. Because, if, obviously, in fact, that you've only joined a ship, so you can only necessarily take on a rating in that ship. And the captain points them and the captain can and does disrate them, usually for misconduct and occasionally possibly for inefficiency. The reference in the logs tend to suggest that it's usually for misconduct of some kind. They need to impress their officers in order to get petty officer status, but then what they'll get at the end of this commission is a certificate which will state the rating that they had reached during the course of that commission and how long they'd been at it. And it would also give a comment on their performance. Now you can see, obviously, surprisingly and unsurprisingly, there's a tendency to go for very good and good. But there are odd ones uh, where it says 0%, that just means it's a, there's a very tiny number, so it can't really, Excel couldn't cope with the, uh, the small numbers. So you get bad, very bad, unsatisfactory and useless. And then very excellent for, for the really, really good ones, there's not very many of those either. 
But I think the captains did take these seriously because, of course, they needed this information when they were looking at men that they hadn't known before. They wanted the certificates to be a reasonable reflection of what the men's abilities were. And if you said that someone had been very good and that they'd had a petty officer rating, then you'd be confident giving them, say, a quartermaster on your ship. There are men who clearly will wait around until they can find a ship where they can get a petty officer berth rather than go as a naval seaman on another ship. There's a kind of career structure even in spite of the, the lack of continuous service and the lack of actually joining the Navy. There is actually quite a, a serious structure going on and there are men who use that to build a career and who eventually perhaps um, took a pension. We would ordinarily say that you leave, certificate's just good perhaps and you don't go back and you're not really ever entitled to anything. You had to have, initially at this period anyway, 20 years service. You can get something for less service later, but it's, it's quite a long time to build up in chunks over that period, and of course most of them don't make it to, don't get a pension. I found a very interesting memoir from a sailor who uh, actually joined in 1855 as a boy. He ran away to sea from a little village in Yorkshire, which actually makes him rather atypical. He tried to go to sea in the merchant service and couldn't get a berth, and ended up coming south and joining the Navy. And he clearly, he wrote this memoir quite a lot after he'd left, and he clearly took a great deal of pride in his service. But he was away for seven years because first in the North Sea and then he went to China, on the China Station for the Second Opium War. And then his ship comes back to home waters. And he's progressed and he's become an able seaman. He is a petty officer by this point, although I can't remember what his rating is. And he comes back and he joins um, the Cornwallis line of battleship, which was lying in Hull as Coast Guard ship. And he really wants to join the Coast Guard. And clearly what's going on here, he's been away for seven years. He's seen his parents once in that time. He doesn't want to be actually at the back and call of the Admiralty anymore. He wants to have that kind of home service. He tries to get into the Coast Guard because obviously that would be a useful home service. But the captain won't release him because he wants three petty officers and Hargreaves is one of them. So instead he buys his discharge from the Royal Navy. His memoir suggests he thought this was the worst thing he ever did. And certainly it's true that if he'd sailed until 1877 he would have got a pension. And I haven't been able to find out. what He went back to Yorkshire. He crops up in the census later. But I haven't really been able to find out what happened to him. But presumably he didn't make, you know, he didn't feel he'd made a great success of his life after the Navy. But you can see that's one of the ways where there's a, there's a bit of a tension between the advantages of the old system and the new one. And that going back to what we looked at earlier with the sort of marriage rates and the, and the ability to see your family and to have leave gets more important, obviously, perhaps as the older you get. And the old system actually allowed for sailors to manage their own lives in a way once we were in peacetime that the uh, new system really didn't, and that wasn't uh, very popular. The letters home, they're not going to be saying, oh, I don't miss at all, but you do get these really quite, quite sad ones. I've had a very rough cruise this last, and a very cold, cold one, which is what John Ford wrote in 1848. But that doesn't mean that these men wouldn't want to serve in the Royal Navy anymore. This is what they get at the end, and that they could show when they came back. There are occasional detailed descriptions. Uh, one boy was described as an abominable bad character. Joseph Pedler, who was a first-class boy on Wolf in 1843, was given a certificate to say he was good as far as in him lies, which I don't, would have been a great help to him in his future career. It's a crude system, but I don't think we can assume it's totally inaccurate. And you can see that the men did keep their certificates because where the description books survive, they would list their previous service, which is the only list that they got the certificate for it. And you get you know, quite long lists of ships on which men had served, and they clearly carefully preserved their certificates to take. And they would also stay in touch, you know, to some extent with their officers. And they'd write to a particular captain who they'd served with and ask for help finding a berth or a particular recommendation if they knew that there was a ship commissioning and that they would like to join. I guess I'll conclude by saying that the professional sailors who crewing the ships in the 19th century were, I mean, initially, of course, a lot of them the same men who'd done so during the Napoleonic Wars. There are, you can see, the start of the new sort of more specialised careers in gunnery and this is a bit too early for engineers, but you just start to get engineer boys appearing on some of the ships in this period. So you'd, some of the more technical careers are just starting as the sailing navy starts to fade out. But I think, arguably, life had definitely improved for these men compared to life in 1800, not least because of leave availability and being able to choose. And the Royal Navy offered them really quite an interesting and rewarding career. It was a bit more dangerous than staying at home, perhaps, but it certainly, they didn't have any trouble appealing to a reasonable number of men to join the Navy and to stay with the Navy. And I think that you can see something like continuous services reflecting things that had already been happening in practice in the Navy in this period, and it's not all about the employer. Uh, the sailors had actually been negotiating the system themselves to construct a sensible career.
and they were professional naval ratings uh, before the continuous service started. And without, obviously, these highly professional sailors, the Royal Navy would not have been able to fulfil the uh, role that we discussed at the beginning of being the, one of the part of the triangle supporting the Pax Britannica. Please note that any views expressed in this presentation are entirely and solely those of the speaker and do not necessarily reflect the official thinking and policy of their organisation, Her Majesty's Government or the Ministry of Defence. Dr Preston can be contacted by email at virginia.preston at sas.ac.uk